Welcome everybody to Cheryl's Get Your Life Back podcast. I'm so excited today that I have my new guest. And those of you who follow me, you know that today's topic, because I've been posting everywhere, is mental health and finding new purpose. For those of you who are new to my podcast, you need to get over to SoundCloud, you need to go over to iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and I'm on YouTube as well. And most of my interviews will go live on YouTube and all of my audio platforms. So welcome, welcome. Thanks for joining in. I'm so glad that I have a guest today. His name is Mr. Chris Love. Welcome, Mr. Chris Love. <laughs> hey, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be talking to you. Yeah, so I'm excited today, and a lot of you who do know me, you know I'm in a mental health professional beside being a um, certified life purpose coach, and mm -hmm. so I love, you know, the topic of mental health and coping and finding your purpose and emotional wellness. I'm all about that because to me, no matter what you do, if you don't deal with a lot of unhealed areas, and I know Chris can agree with me, it will affect you in, in every other aspect of your life. And so mm -hmm. it's so important to deal with these things because it even make you a better leader, you know, and a lot of times I talk to a lot of leaders, you know, Chris, who um, they're in position of, positions of leadership. However, I can see a lot of times trauma that hasn't been dealt with. Like I've gone to services, even at church or something where the preacher or a leader may be speaking with anger and you can see like a, a lot of unhealed places. So it's like I have this passion to help people like really deal with this stuff because what happens, you infect other people when you're not healed or when you're not working on things and you're not self-aware because I believe self-awareness is so powerful by itself. Oh yeah, being self-aware, especially with the issues that I have to deal with just on my own, being married, yes. you gotta be self-aware. I mean, <laughs> usually when I'm telling my wife something, my face is saying something different. I mean, oh, okay. completely different. And I that might just be a personality thing, <laughs> but uh, I know what you mean by if you don't deal with the issues, it affects everything in your life. Before yes. I started dealing with my issues, I mean, I, I was a monster. I mean, put it, just put it simple. Okay. Uh, I'm going to let you get I, into your story. Uh-huh. I, I just had a whole different side of me, you know. I understand. And I'm definitely going to let you tell your story, but I want to let everybody get to know who you are. So I'm going to read a little bit about Chris Love. And I'm going to let him take the wheel. <laughs> so Chris Love was born. I grabbed your um, bio on, because um, he has a book he's going to talk about too. <laughs> but I went to Amazon and saw this wonderful um, bio. Chris Love was born on May 27, 1984 in Chester, South Carolina. He has been writing his entire life and has always wanted to become a published author of his first book, series city of red part one and is also working on several other projects and i'll let him get into that as well chris is a differently abled combat veteran you know i use differently able because i know a lot of times people are trying to get away from disabled and stuff like that so i'm with the yeah, new I've, school i haven't heard that before but yeah, yeah i'm with okay. the new school social workers and mental health professors. we're trying to say differently able or person with disabilities yeah so it won't come with that um, stigma, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so differently able, because we all have disabilities in some area, combat veteran for the U.S. Army, having served from 2005 to 2010, after suffering injuries from an explosion in Afghanistan, Chris became a stay-at-home stay -home dad and now has five children with his wife of 10 years, Leela Alila. That's Lila. Lila. The call to serve never left Chris. In 2018, he was elected as trustee for the village of Teresa in upstate New York, where he currently lives. If you would like to follow Chris out at the end of this podcast, I'll let him give you all of his info if you want to follow him as well and buy his book and, and, and hear more of his story. But thank you, Chris, again for being here. And yesterday we're talking about mental health and finding new purpose, because I know that's a journey that you had to actually go on. And I'm always authentically grateful you know first i want to say thanks for serving our country and it's not just a cliche i always think about people who serve because i think about we take it for granted how the military protects us from a lot of stuff that we don't even know about i'm sure yeah but you get to see firsthand and so i'm always thinking i have a lot of family in the military anyway <laughs> a lot yeah, so i did um, i did too yeah I'll close yeah yeah so 
let's, I want to get, I want you to share your story. And I know one of the things we're going to talk about is like PTSD and the symptoms that come along with that. And you having to battle with, deal with that type of trauma, because it is definitely a trauma from being, you know, witnessing traumatic experiences. Um, I just want to read a little bit of some of the symptoms of PTSD for people who don't know what post-traumatic stress disorder is. And it's experiencing, in a nutshell, experiencing or witnessing a traumatic and terrifying event that later triggers symptoms of stress, anger, nightmares, breakouts, bedwetting, flashbacks, anxiety, depression, intrusive thoughts, and more. And so I just wanted to read that. And those are some of the symptoms that some of my clients that I work with, even children ages six who have you know, unfortunately have symptoms of PTSD because they witnessed some kind of traumatic experiences, whether it was sexual or violent. Yeah. I work with kids who've seen murder. And what I tell people is that even if you're not the person in the act of the traumatic experience, just witnessing alone, you can have the same symptoms as a person who actually went through the traumatic event. And that's something yeah. I learned, you know, doing trauma training and stuff like that. But yeah, yeah, it's something people don't think about when you say PTSD, you might the first thing that comes to mind is a war veteran. You right. Don't have to go to, uh, you don't have to go to war right. to, uh, to, to have PTSD. Exactly. You could have had, uh, had an um, abusive marriage. Exactly. Right. Absolutely. Or, you know, had, or had a miscarriage or, or something, you know, just That's something right. bad. And it's, it's trauma. Yeah. And so they, they expanded the definition when, they, you know, the longer you live and people continue to research and, and, and work with people, then, you know, they're always finding out new, you know, information. But anyway, I do want you to share your story, wherever you want to start from. I definitely want to go through, you know, your ch if you want, however far you want to go back, whether it's from your childhood, if you had trauma back then, military experiences, and then I'll get into the question about how are you able to cope and overcome and where you at now. All right. Uh, I won't go all the way back to when I was born. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but I mean, I will say this though, when I was born, I was born with the umbilical cord wrapped around my neck. Oh, first traumatic yeah. experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I won't go into details about how that most likely happened. Okay. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. But my face was blue. My mom has always told me and then he smacked me on the rear end and I started breathing and crying. You know how babies do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, all right. So, so you said I joined the army in 2005. Right. I'll never forget. You go to a place called a MEP station. And when you go there, it's sort of, it's really rigorous obstacles that mm -hmm. these guys who are most likely former drill sergeants or, I don't know who they were, but they were to me drill sergeants, the way they were barking at you and, and screaming and yelling. You're in this place where you're having to do high knees across the floor in your boxers. Right. And you're, and you're getting medical treatment. You, you're getting checked over here in this room for one thing, getting checked over here in this room for another. And uh, on that on that very day where I was supposed to go to the MEP station, my mom was in a car wreck. Oh. and And so – Naturally, I wanted to go to my mom and, you know, see how I could help. I was, I was willing to throw it all away just to go see if I could help the family, you know. Right. And my, my dad said, no, she's fine. But even if she wasn't, there's nothing you can do. You go do what you got to do. Right. And that, was, that reminded me of something. I remember going to the MEP station in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, there's this guy I used to work for. He told me to to worry about the stuff you can control and all the other things you can't control, forget about it. Mm, okay. Did did I say that right? Yeah, the stuff you said, the stuff that you can't control, to kind of forget about that and just deal with what you can't control. Basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I couldn't control anything over there with my mom, but I could control my next step. So I went to the MEP right. station and and a funny story is um uh, I didn't perform to the standards of this one guy and he, and he basically kicked me out of the place. Oh, wow. Okay. And, and I ignored him and went and kind of ducked into another line and stayed. Okay. And, and that's how I got into the army. He, oh. <laughs> I, he, uh, I, I was just wearing boxers, you know, and, wow. and 
I wasn't comfortable wearing boxers, doing all the exercises they had me doing. Mm -hmm. And so I made the guy mad because I kind of smarted off at him. I was like, I'm, I, what do you want me to do? Right. You know, I'm just a young, I was a young kid that was 21, you know, I was a street kid. I was, <laughs> and so I popped off at the mouth and he basically told me to get out. Army didn't need people like me. Okay. And I said, the heck with that. I ended up, like I said, sneaking back into another line. And I remember later on that guy saw me and we kind of looked at each other and he just carried on. He was determined. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, but I got into the army really, uh, I felt a calling. Okay. You know, but that's just part of it. The other part is I wanted to, I, I had a young son, a, 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 like three or four something like that. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I wanted to be a good father and I wanted to be able to support him and, and all that. And I knew, I actually was self-aware of myself. I, I knew how immature I was. I knew that I needed help. Mm -hmm. I, knew, I knew that I needed to do something to get the upper hand, to, to do better, to have a better chance. And I remember I was working in the Dollar, the dollar Tree. Okay. And oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was sending at this time, right before I joined the army, I was working at Dollar Tree and I was, I was sending my entire check to my son and his mom. And then I was basically borrowing money from my parents. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so that's how I was miserable. Uh, it was, it was so hard. Um, wow. Yeah. The financial, financial sh hardship. <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> being from being from the South, you, let me tell you another quick story mm -hmm. about me. Being from the South, I I had a lot of bad experiences. Okay. With with people of color. Really? Okay. Yeah, and it's not that I hated people of color. Right. I just had bad experiences. So my views were skewed for a long time, you know? I understand. And actually, what I'm telling you right now, I debated in my mind whether I was going to say it or not, but I no, think I it's important. Honest. Yeah. I think it's important to say it so that people can see how people can change because of other people's right. actions. So I went to North Carolina to be with my son, Greenville, North Carolina, and I had to live with his mom and her, her folks in this like three-bedroom apartment in Greenville, North Carolina. Okay. And while I was doing that, I, I joined the uh, police academy and oh, I was okay. working and I was working part time at a, uh, at a, uh, at a speedy automotive service center, mm -hmm. working on cars and something happened where I got kicked out of the, the apartment I was living in and I didn't have a home. And this guy that I worked with named Greg Branch. I'll never forget him. Mm -hmm. We were buddies at work and everything, but when when I told him the situation I was in, he said, "Hey, come come stay at my place. I don't have a bed or nothing. You might have to sleep on the floor until you figure out what you're going to do. But come on, man. Yeah, like look that. over your head. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that guy he was a black guy. Okay. And to be honest, that was the first time I ever had a hand. You know reached out to me from someone that's a different color right. that, that wasn't trying to hurt me in some way, just right. to be mm -hmm. honest. And it's like something clicked in my head and I realized what I'm telling you now, that my views have been skewed. Right. You know, we were, right. I lived in a bubble, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And when I got out of it, I realized that part of me was immature right and that part of me grew up you know but mm -hmm. anyway from that situation I, I i went back home and i got the job at dollar tree and i heard an advertisement on the radio about the army oh okay and, and it reminded me that i had this you know kind of feeling that maybe i want to join the army so then i was like that's that's the answer mm -hmm. so I'm gonna, I'm gonna join the army now you felt like it'd give you some kind of stability and financial support and all of that. You thought about yeah. all of that. Okay. I needed, I needed that. I knew I needed something. So yeah. it wasn't working. I'm working right. at Dollar Tree and I'm giving my whole check to my, 
to my yeah. son and his mom and I'm living off my parents. I was like, this can't be right. So I'm 20. I was 21 years old. Right. Mm -hmm. I was like, this can't be, I, I got to do something right. else. Yeah. And they don't pay a lot. So yeah. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, so I joined the army in 2005. It was a delayed entry program. I went on in 2006 to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Okay. In January. And boy, I tell you, that was a, <laughs> I, I can't describe. I, I wish I can go back and just see the place, but. Wow. I mean, basic training was so much fun. I mean. <laughs> oh, you enjoyed it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it was fun. It was hard. I mean, I one time fell asleep when I was on guard duty and I got caught. I think the drill sergeants were outside the door, you know, trying to catch me. <laughs> okay. And they caught me nodding off. And then I made the whole, because I fell asleep, the whole platoon had to get up and do push ups. Oh, no. <laughs> I had to oh, stand there. I stood there. They made me stand there and watch while they did push ups. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Those good times. I heard about those type of punishments. Even some parents use that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it works sometimes. I, I I didn't fall back asleep, so I guess I guess it worked on me. Okay. <laughs> and I was afraid somebody was gonna kick my tail later, but no one said anything. Okay. I guess okay. everyone I guess everyone understood, you know. Right, right, right. Um Yeah, in 2000, 2006, I was in basic training. Before the end of May, I had graduated basic in my special my uh my my special school AIT for my army job, which is in field artillery. I went to an airborne school in Georgia. Okay. And I met one of my my greatest friends ever there, named Lazaro, another guy of color. It, it, okay. There's you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh. Yeah, Lazaro, Chris Lazaro. I, I don't know where that guy is now, but this guy would help me up the steps every night because I twisted my knee. Wow, okay. And he'd help me up the steps and a whole different building from his to my room. And I'd go up and lay in bed because I hurt my knee in airborne school and I wanted to graduate and I was trying to hide it. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to get caught with my hurt knee because they, they, they'd get rid of me if they saw that I got hurt. Right. So... Before the end of 2006, I was deployed to Afghanistan. And, wow. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it happened so fast. By the end of 2006, it was December. Uh, I'm not sure what day in December. It was before Christmas. It was near Christmas. I think it was like a week or two before Christmas. That's when my truck hit the IED, the improvised explosive device. Okay. It was, it was actually... Uh, two anti-tank mines together. Okay. Wow. And it had a trip wire coming out. Ooh. So I'll paint the scene for you and the, the listeners and viewers. Uh, there was an area in Afghanistan where we had to go and uh, secure because the night before there had been and some bad guys who got destroyed by some helicopters. And after that event, they found a device that could have potentially been a bomb. So we got called out to go secure the area so that a team could come out and see the device and inspect it and possibly mm -hmm. explode it if need be. Right. And so when we got to the area, we were the first truck in. And the first truck in, we were among, I don't know, 10 trucks some or more okay. in a convoy. Pulled into the area and we sat there literally all day. Uh, I don't know when it started, but we were there from right after we woke up to like uh, dawn. Wow. Okay. And sunset, something like that. But, uh, and uh, so since we were the first, first truck in, as it happened, we were the last truck out. And when we entered the area, we mm -hmm. also exited the area, the exact same space. Oh, right. The same road, same everything. Okay. The crazy thing is, I, my truck was the one that picked up the tripwire. Oh. You, you see what I mean? Even yeah. like we, we entered and exited the same access, 
we were the first in, the last out. And even with all those trucks going up and down, it right. picked up our wheel, you know. Mm -hmm. And the trip wire wrapped around the left front tire of up there near the driver. And it exploded underneath the uh, front left fender. The truck went into the air six or seven feet. Wow. So, somewhere around in there, the front end, and that I'm I'm about five six. I left okay. a crater behind that when I stood in the center, it was uh -huh. up to my waist. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I'm gonna tell you when when it happened. When it happened, uh, I was in the gunner seat. I was up there with the with the machine gun up mm -hmm. in the turret. Mm -hmm. So I was the guy behind the gun on top of the truck. Okay, yeah. And, and so when it exploded, I ducked down into the truck, as my trainer taught me. Okay. And, and one thing about it is I wasn't wearing knee pads or elbow pads. Okay. And the reason why, I, I could have been, it wasn't required, but the reason why is because whenever I wore those things, I always get hung up on the, on the wall of the turret or something. I never can duck in fast enough, you know? Oh, so, so it's like I can hold you back. Okay. Yeah, so in my training, I figured, well, if this thing actually happens, I better, I better be able to move as fast as I can. So I didn't wear knee pads or elbow pads. Gotcha. So when I dunked into the truck, something, um, something cut into my right knee. Uh, uh, and that's a whole another part of the story I'll get to in a second. Uh huh. And I went into the truck, and uh, the interpreter that was next to me, he was an Afghani. For some reason, this guy, he... Uh, Right after the bomb went off, he opened the door and got out. And I don't know where he went to. But I was so out of it, I rolled out of the truck. And I landed on the ground outside. And, I, and I'm out of it. You know, I'm just... Right. Disoriented everything, right. I remember laying back on the truck and knowing where I was. But it's just really hard to explain mm -hmm. how the feeling of being out. I mean... The, the only thing I could hear was the wind in my ears. And mm -hmm. then the next thing I know, the sergeant in the driver's seat, he said, he said, love, what the hell are you doing outside the truck? Get back in. Wow. Like that. And that snapped me back. And okay. I climbed back into the truck, closed the door, and I got into the turret. And I, and I held on to it because I was going to fall if I didn't. I knew that. But I also had to prepare myself because I didn't know if we were going to have contact. I don't know where it was going to come from. Right. After that, they could have came at us, but nothing happened. Right. Um, so as, as I'm, I skip ahead a little bit. It's okay. Uh, I remember going back to the to base. I fell asleep on the way back. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. It was, man, that was rough. And, um, I stayed in Afghanistan. I stayed, I stayed in the, uh, I stayed in Afghanistan for, uh, for the rest of the tour. I never went back home or anything, but I was messed up after that. I remember every time I had to go back out, it got to the point where I couldn't stand. I had to hold on to the walls of the turret that I was in. Right. I was, I'd get sick. And mm -hmm. really nauseated. I mean, like, I'm going to throw up my guts. Right. It was horrible. I'd break out in a sweat. Like, I just, it, it was, it was a nightmare. Yeah. Scenario. It's like trying to break your whole nervous system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was, it was like I got stung by something. And it was like really, really going after my nervous system. Right. Right. And I'll never forget it. I just kept, I just kept going at it. I didn't tell anybody about that, though. You were trying to hide it? You didn't? Okay. Yeah. And I, I kept going at it, and I kept getting better at it, and it kept feeling less and less, and eventually, it, you know, it went away. Oh, okay. I could, I could do my job and all. Okay. And, and uh, it wasn't until about a year after that is when I really started getting worn down by the PTSD and stuff. So what year was this? 2007, 2008? Well, it was 2006. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, 2007, 2008. Okay. But really, thing, but really things were happening to me, and I didn't really know what was happening to me. Right. Mm-hmm. You know? And it, it wasn't really until my knee blew out, the right knee, the one that got injured in the, in the explosion. Right. It, uh, my knee blew out. I tore my, my ACL and my okay. meniscus. And it wasn't really until that did, that I, things started to flip and I, I started really changing my personality, changing and things like that. Okay. And ever since, ever since that time my knee blew out and then I was on rear D because I was trying to get out of the army because of my knee. Mm-hmm. Uh, I dealt with a personality change, a character change. Which was becoming short, more aggressive, or? Yeah, I was very short-tempered. I was okay. doing things that I would never have done otherwise. Right. I, I kind of, I kind of, I'm sorry, my son came in. Okay, no problem. <laughs> hey, go on. Hey, I'm talking to someone. Go on. <laughs> Go on. Go on. Go on. I want to see. You can peep, you can peep in. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Handsome. <laughs> you going to go now? Yeah. I'm in the middle of talking about some serious <laughs> stuff and I'm smiling. Wait. 10 different reactions going on. <laughs> Just get out. Can you get out? Now they want to stay in. <laughs> Next, want to body slam them. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> <sighs> I got about three other kids, so they'll probably be popping in at some point. Oh, that's know. right. You have a couple of them. Got, that's right. <laughs> they'll go out there and tell them I'm talking to someone, then they'll poke their head in, you know. <laughs> but uh, where did I leave off? Let's see. Oh, yeah. If your, if your attitude started changing, you was coming short tempered, more aggressive. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I became very aggressive. Uh, uh -huh. This whole different side of me started to form. I was, right. I was going, to, I was going to therapy and speaking to one or two different people, and it was, I wasn't sure how helpful it was being. I was going to um, ask you how does counseling help you emotionally, but you're answering it. <laughs> yeah, um, at first, I'm not sure it, it was helping, but back then I didn't see it. I was going to say, mm -hmm. were you receptive? Uh, I was trying. Probably. Okay. You know? It wasn't until I had a guy named Ken who was really good. He, I, I forget the name of, you probably tell me. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, he made me sit in a room with him mm -hmm. with the lights off and I'd close my eyes Okay. And, I, and I'd recount the entire, the entire event. Okay. That can be hard. Minute, but... by, minute by minute, moment by moment. Mm -hmm. Until I didn't have the nervous sweats until I didn't have anxiety until it okay. became easy, easier and easier, you know? Okay. It was, uh, it was intensive and it uh -huh. wasn't until I started doing that, that I, did I start to see, um, breakthroughs in me. Okay. But, but even then this was years ago. I'm talking about. Right. I mean, this was 2010, 2011. Yeah. Okay. Even, even then it was, take one step forward, three steps back with me. Right. I, I didn't want to go around in crowded spaces. I, uh, yeah. I, I was a monster to my wife sometimes. Okay. I, I was just mean. I, I was a lot of bad stuff. Right. All the symptoms and, of your trauma. Mm -hmm. And, and, and also what's funny is you can be a monster one minute, but the next minute you can be a sweetheart, you know, yeah. you can right. be a, yeah, it sounds be, like my biological dad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Big heart, everything. But well, his came from, he drank and stuff like that, but it brought out like a monster side of him. But when he didn't yeah. drink, he was the sweetest person in the world. Nobody even believed that he was treating my mother a certain way, like, honey, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. No. yeah uh, <laughs> I, I actually, I don't drink. I, uh, alcoholism's in my family. So, okay. I made the conscious effort to stay away from alcohol. That's and good. I don't even smoke anything. I don't drink alcohol. You like me, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just stayed away from it. I stopped when I got married. I stopped drinking. 
Okay. Okay. And Sweet. and I don't go to bars or anything like that because whenever you go to bars, I always end up getting into something because I'm telling you I'm cocky and oh okay. And gotcha. someone someone does something, I want to do something back. You know, I okay. <laughs> Uh, so I just don't go in those situations. I just stay out of them. You know? I had self-awareness coming in. <laughs> You're like, I, yeah. I know what's going to trigger me, so I'm going to stay away from that. Yeah. Yeah, I just stay out of it. I mean, recently, I'm I'm 30, I'm, how old am I? I'm 35. Uh, okay. Just recently, I went to a place with my wife and family, and something happened that night. Oh. And, and I, don't, I don't even, I hate going to places like that. Oh, uh, wow. So I just, anyway, so... I got diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and um, uh, traumatic brain injury. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. worked with I worked with mostly men for about three and a half years who had traumatic brain injuries as well, helping them with memory loss, a whole lot of different, you know, yeah. different things that they had to contend with, even the insecurities. And I even worked with men who came out of rehabilitation. Some of them went coma for a long time. They came out. But part of my job was to help them integrate back into the community again. So then we mm -hmm. have to deal with uh, phobias and, you know, fears and, and, and the PTSD symptoms. And then even with family members not understanding them. And a lot of times I would tell my clients, I said, you know what? I said, sometimes it's us. Sometimes family distance themselves because sometimes we don't know how to deal with you know, you as a, you know, maybe having some different, some d being differently able and yeah. it's not you is that sometimes we don't know how to interact with you anymore. And that's where the educate education piece coming while with, you know, work, talk with the wife, talk with the mom or dad or whatever, just to get them to kind of understand, but yeah. you know, cause there's so many different challenges. So it was always different layers that we had to address. Yeah. This whole process has been dealing with layer after layer of, mm -hmm issues with me right it's just been uh, i'm at a point now I'm, I'm at a point now where i can see where ptsd is holding me back and okay. keeping me from being the 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 entire person that i can be okay um that's why i'm on here with you that's why i've started doing these interviews okay partly partly to you know market my book and our yeah, podcast absolutely. and all but yeah. this stuff i'm talking about is this is my passion because what i'm telling you i can't tell my parents for some reason you know what i mean because the emotional well, attachment it's always harder yeah. to tell family members and even friends because of the relationship it's always easier to talk to people you don't know yeah they're going to hear this and they're going to they're going to have the comments yeah yeah well they're going to understand even better yeah and and hopefully people that knew me before the army will, re will hear this and, and understand right. better about PTSD. Cause I'll right. never ever be able to, I'll never even try to tell them. Um, okay. but <clears throat> I started, uh, I started writing poems about how I felt a while back. I saw that. Okay. And, okay. and I'm going to have a book published. It's on the back burner, but, Mm -hmm. It's going to be published eventually. Okay. And it focuses on PTSD and TBI and my anger and, and this other side of me. Yes. And during that process, I realized something. It, it's very simple for me. And I don't know how true this is for any other veterans with PTSD, similar to my events that happened to me. But um, what happened to me, I kind of feel like I got punched in the face. Okay. And I never got to hit the guy back. You know what okay, I mean? Okay, yes. You sound like, yeah, you're making me think about somebody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I had this realization that some some guy put this bomb in the ground to kill to kill someone. Uh -huh. It ended up, ended up being, you know, I was one of the people. So I never got a chance to, to get this guy back. I, I always wonder where this guy is. What's his life like? Wow. Is he even alive still? I'll never have closure on that. It makes me angry. It makes me angry that... He got a shot to kill me, but I never got a shot to kill him. Okay. It, it, there's a lot of stuff going on right there. And it I is. finally, yeah. I finally saw it. I finally recognized it. Okay. And I isolated it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was able to put, put that idea in my mind, like over here. Okay. Yes. And, separate, yeah. and separate this stuff from what is happening in front of me right now. You know what I mean? Right. 
Yes. Because before then, before I, before I realized the root, what I, what I call the root of my anger. Yes. Because in all honesty, I want to kill the person that put the bomb on the ground. I, I and, understand that feeling. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'll never have the chance. And, and so you have to deal with those emotions. You might have to deal with forgiveness, but we won't go there now. Cause you know, forgiveness is not about the, the person it's about you moving on. And it could be forgiving yourself feeling like, even if you have to tap into that world of, I didn't get a chance to get the person back, but I got to forgive myself because I felt like I couldn't get the person back and kind of move on. But that's a process too. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to eventually come just to accept the fact that it is the way it is and right and just kind of leave it in my past and i don't know if i'll ever get to that point uh yeah. and a part of me doesn't know if i ever really want to get to that point because i've been living with this yeah the way i've been for so long i'm kind of afraid to you know get rid of it uh, does it make sense uh, uh there's yeah, you're making... of... go ahead uh, I, I was i was just going to say there's this other side of me and it's, it's sort of the, the soldier side of me. And it's kind of like, if I say goodbye to, if I, if I come to terms with the fact that I'll never be able to change what I want to change, which is kill the guy to put the bomb on the ground, mm -hmm. then I'll be saying goodbye to the soldier in me. You know what I mean? Right. The, the, the killer, the protector, the, right. the fighter, the, I don't know. It's, yeah, you have to put that in, in this perspective and, 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 and realize that it's not that you're forgetting and you, you're diminishing or minimizing that, but learning to, that you have to go on and live and, and, you know, cope and thrive, you know, and know that your heart was in the right place. You want, you're protected, like you said, that's what you were trained to do. That's what you want to do. And, those, and that is good. And at the same time, um, live and go on and not be held captive or prisoner to those emotions. You know what I'm saying? Because then you want to live life and you want to be free and present with your wife, with your kids, you know, stuff like that. So you, it's like a decision you have to make in your mind. Like, I'm not going to let this hold me captive. I got to be present. Um, and I was going to ask you before I get into that, if spirituality if you or, or faith played a part in your role, because if it did, I was going to say, those are the type of things we believe to give to God because it's too much for us. We human. And if you believe in God or higher power, whatever, it's like, you know what? Cause I've went through some other traumas in my life and, and that's helped me to learn. Like, you know what? I'm going to compartmentalize this. I'm giving this to you. I have to wash my hands because I cannot allow it to hold me captive. And because I believe there's an enemy out there, the enemy, my, my mindset has always been, I'm not going to let him have the last say over my life where he just, I feel defeated all the time. So I had to make a decision that, you know, believing that I'm more than a conqueror. I'm a, you know, I'm Victor. It's like, you know, speaking that into you, speaking over your own life. You know, mm. speaking life into yourself that you're going to live, you're not going to die, not only physically, but I mean, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. So did spirituality play a role? Do you, you know, you have any belief, a faith system? Well, I'm from the South, so I grew up in, you know, Baptist churches. Okay. And, but I didn't really pray or anything while I was over there, but I did okay. carry uh, rosary beads with me for some okay. reason. I'm not a okay. Catholic, never have been. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and, but, but I wore them as kind of a protection, you know. Gotcha. And I kept, there's this little, uh, like a mini Bible. Yeah. That I had on me. Yeah. That I, had from my, I think I had from my childhood. I know those and, Bibles. <laughs> and, I, and I carried it, I had a little pocket. Yes. On, my, on the bottom of my leg and it fit okay. perfect. And okay. I, I wore it every day and I was wearing it when I got hit with IED. Actually. Wow. Okay. But it's not, I didn't pray. I didn't. I just uh, I just wore those things as protection. Okay, but you had some kind of faith in it, you know? Yeah. Because you were in the war, you know? Yeah. Okay. Um, so so you, you, you try to do whatever you can to try to cope and deal with stuff. Yeah, I was doing whatever I could, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And those things brought me comfort, so I wore yeah. that stuff, you know? Right, right. And then... I guess a part of me believed or mm -hmm. wanted to believe or right. hope, you know, Exactly. my greatest fear over there was, was dying in an instant, you know, not having a chance to fight. Like if I'm going to get killed, if I'm going to die, I always said, I want to, you know, at least be given a chance to live, e even if it's right. painful. And I live yeah. for six hours 
And, you know, I mean, so I, I don't want to just, you know, go and be gone in an instant. You know I what I mean? You. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I remember wearing that stuff and just, that's my, that was my one request. It's not like I said, I never said I don't want to die. That was, I just didn't want to die just in a blink of an eye. That was it. Yeah, okay. Something about being taken an instant without a fight, you saying, without protecting or like, um, what, what, you, what do you call those people in other countries where they, I can't think of the name right now, but it's like an honor for them fighting against the enemy and dying in the middle of that battle. It said something heroic or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, it's samurai. Not kamikaze. That might be more of that that might be a little Samu- extreme. You're talking about samurais? Maybe. I don't know, but like some other co- cultures, I know it's like an honor to be fighting and dying. If you're dying, you're dying fighting, doing something good for whoever you're protecting, your country or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Sound like you're talking about Klingons from Star Trek too. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so so let's see. I, I had that so I got out of the army in 2010, and okay. I was already married by then. Nine years ago, okay. But it wasn't until 2018, I would I would say, when I finally started living my life the way I wanted to live it. Okay. Without at the behest of my emotions. Okay, right. Because, right. because in 2018 was when I got elected to uh, as trustee in my village. Right. Okay. And it was at that point where I made the decision to start putting myself in uncomfortable positions that have been uncomfortable for me mm-hmm. for the last almost decade. I love and, that. Yeah. And, and so I just, I've, that's the way I've been living my life since then, just put myself in situations that had, you know, been really difficult for me to be in. Right. That is talking to people and talking to, talking to you is difficult. I mean, not right. that you're a difficult person to talk to, but you're easy to talk to. It's just that I, I'm just, it's just really difficult to, right. to do this, you know? Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. So, so now I sit at the table once a month and I'm sitting down with the mayor of the village and other trustees and okay. the village clerk and, wow. and that fills me with pride. And I'm thinking about running for another office someday, okay. maybe, maybe, okay. mayor, <laughs> maybe, right. maybe something else. I don't know, but. So I think it's giving you a sense of purpose and that ties into the mental health and finding a new purpose, something else, you know, you give it back. It's altruistic. You know, you're doing something for other people, some kind of way. And it's also yeah. serving you at the same time. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't have a uniform, but mm-hmm. it gave me another unit, another uniform. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. And I really like that feeling. I really like, talking to people about village issues now okay it's it's giving me the drive to talk to people right people that i would never normally speak to i'll say hey i'm I'm chris love village trustee you know and Mm -hmm. i might ask them what are your concerns you know okay i'll yeah it's things has really turned around for me mentally and emotionally since 2018 okay that's good and then it was also milestones. Finally getting that book published that I've been working on for, and I'm not lying when I say this, I was working on it for 10 years. I believe it because my book that's out there, I worked on it from 2001 and published it in 2011. <laughs> but I did that on purpose because I had was talking about some, prog- some process I was going through while I was writing the book. And I said, by the time I finish this book, I will have accomplished something. So, but... But yeah. I guess you had certain challenges, maybe. Is that what took you long to publish it finally or finish writing it? It was, you know, regular life. And then also uh, we You're kept having healing. kids. Yeah. Uh, what, was, what was that? I was saying then the whole healing process, you know, that you're talking I mean, about dealing with the trauma over those 10 years. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was things inside of me that was finding, it was finding reasons not to finish it. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah. And then I had to, and then there were some things I had to stop doing and get rid of so that I could actually push the book out. Like, okay. uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I had to get rid of my PlayStation. <laughs> I was going to say distractions. <laughs> yeah, dis- distractions. Yes. Because instead of working on my book at 1030 at night, I'm playing a video game. I was like, this can't, I can't keep doing this. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't having fun because I was really feeling torn up by not working on my book, you know? 
Exactly. So I, so I had to get rid of it. Okay. And, and so now I got a book. Well, I had a book published, but I, I pulled it off the market because I found a bunch of a bunch of errors. Okay. So I'm fixing those, and I'm going to republish it. That's good. And uh, and yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a trustee for for Silver Future as long as I keep getting elected. Okay. And, okay. And and yeah, I mean it's it's still a a day to day thing, kind of. Okay. I still, right. Like I, I'm on you know medication. If I don't remember to take it. I'll start to have issues, you know, You're, I'll start right. to go into it. I'll go into a uh, deep depression, the kind where I don't even want to get off the couch type I deal. Stay right there. Yeah. And I'm not so much with the nightmares, you know, I've never okay. really had, I've had nightmares and, you know, bad dreams it's about okay. things over there, but that's one of the things that's never, never really got on me. Mm-hmm. I did have a friend who uh, killed himself over there. Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, Private that's, Bailey. That's another incident that caused more, you know, wow, that's sad to hear that. There was a lot of stuff tied up in that. Me and him, he he was from New York, but from the Bronx. Okay. From the city. So, and I'm from the country. So, me and him, we, we got along good, but then when we didn't get along, we wanted to, like, rip each other's heads off. Really? Wow. Okay. But then all of a sudden, like a day or two later, everything would be fine. Okay. And this is all over in Afghanistan, you know? Yeah. And, and we, we connected and talked about our kids. He, he said he had a daughter and I told him about my son who was young baby. I um, mm -hmm. can't remember how old Alex was back then. Right. But uh, four or five, something like that. Okay. And uh, me and my other friend ended up getting uh, sent to another base and this guy Bailey got left behind. Okay. And, wow. and during that time is when he uh, he killed himself. Ah, uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. All the all the signs were there, you know, that he was. Yeah. He was in trouble, you know. Sometimes you just don't think it's gonna go that far. Yeah. He uh. Yeah. I found out about him uh, randomly. Mm -hmm. uh, at a uh, Ford operating base that was basically on the side of a mountain mm. and I was told private Bailey killed himself and you're going to be asked to go to, uh, go back to this, you know, this other place okay. and, you know, answer questions because we interacted with them. We were, we knew them. So people want to ask questions, you know what I right. mean? Yeah. And, uh, I actually put when I actually put this one sergeant on blast. Oh, really? Okay. Sergeant first class, yeah. I I wrote out a statement, and I actually blamed him for the reason why Bailey killed himself. Uh oh, yeah. Of course. Because yeah, he not, nothing ever came of that. I mean, but. yeah, yeah. Because I know it's just like he didn't make him do it, but he probably sure triggered a whole lot of stuff in him. You know. He was just hard. He was hard on the guy. Yeah. I mean, hard on the guy. Mm hmm. He was. This guy was hard on me. I remember I was uh I was behind the computer and inputting uh meteorological data for my job mm -hmm. and I was having to put it in and this sergeant first class walked in, asked me a question, and while I was working, I answered this question. And because I didn't stop working and stand up parade rest, right. he got pissed off and punished me by making me quit my job and stand outside in full gear what? at parade rest for hours. This is while I was in Afghanistan. Wow. And I'm telling you, I was like one of the best behaved soldiers over there. Wow. This guy was, this guy was just, you know. That's his own. Yeah, he has some own issues, <laughs> ego, whatever it was. I don't know. I could speculate, but. I, don't know. I know, I know, yeah. I don't know. But um, get back to me and off that character. Mm -hmm. uh, my Bailey Bailey passed away, and it wasn't until you know I was back in a, I was back in um Fort Drum, up here in New York. Uh -huh. How long ago was it after? A couple of, a year or two. Okay, I'm from New I York. Remember, uh -huh. I remember I remember walking in, and his stuff that was with him over there in Afghanistan uh -huh. right. had just gotten back. Okay. And so I saw all his stuff with his name uh -huh. on it, you know, and I just it just. I, 
it just reminded me, you know, and I just, I still have that thought kind of, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that's more, that's, you know, that's a lot too. Mm-mm-mm. Wow. Well, you made it through. I hope you daily do things that help you feel good about, you know, where, where you come from, what you're doing and, and kind of just being present for your family. And you said you had a better place now. So, and then you have a new purpose and you're doing some things and that's good for mm-hmm. your, um, for your children to see. Yeah, I'm doing a lot of a lot of good things that's rubbing off on them, like okay. writing. They, okay. Right. I write, so they all love to write. I got. Oh, good. My, they they want to publish books like me. They want to okay. write. They, it's really cool how that's working out. And then also, my wife and I are motivating each other. She's she's uh, writing a, a book of poems and. Okay. We're gonna, we're gonna have it published. Uh, I think it was December 10th, this okay. year. We're going to have it published. I'm not sure about the day, but right. first, first or second week of December. Okay. So you're starting stuff. That's good. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah but, we're doing things and making moves and, and it's a slow burn process. Right. And Tell me about your podcast. Week. You both of you guys doing a podcast? Yeah, we're doing it together, yeah. actually. Uh, it, it's called Get Down On It With The Loves. I like the title. And, <laughs> yeah. Well, the, what's funny is the title... It, the title is a phrase that my wife came up with years ago. Oh, okay. She, she's, she's got a really funny sense of humor and she came up with this song called get down on it with the loves that she was singing with the kids to, you know, just to get them riled up and you know have fun right. with them and stuff. And then flash forward years later to, to about this time period. And I'm thinking about doing a YouTube channel or a podcast for me right. to, 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 advertise my book or or right. something like that and then in the process of trying to figure out the format and topics and stuff like that oh yeah i said i should we should do a podcast me and my wife it'd be crazy yeah you know, it'd be hilarious so i go downstairs and i said to her how about we do a podcast together and it's called get down on it with the loves she didn't even think about it she just looked at me and said let's do it and <laughs> it sounds like a tv show <laughs> I love it. And, and we've we've done about five episodes and it's okay. so much fun, so much work. Yeah, oh yeah. And we and there's this the last episode. Oh my god, the last episode. I don't know how we even got it done. We got it done because we went on a date. Okay. And we did it in the car on the way to our date. Because that was the only time we could have time to actually do the podcast. But people like that. They like the real moments when you do stuff like that. You're on your way in your car, you're doing something in the house, cook, whatever. I like, you know, that's people are more real and authentic and people like that. Feel like they can relate to you and your yeah. wife and the children if they're ever in there. <laughs> yeah, the first the first episode, uh, you know, uh, Connor that just popped his head in. Yes. He's in the first episode. Okay. Yeah, talking about Stranger Things from Netflix. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he loves that show. And uh wow. Yeah, we just uh in our podcast, we just we we talk about what interests us. We talk about uh, you know, uh parenting with four kids and and you know, being married for 10 years. You know, just tips and, you know, trade secrets we might have learned and okay. And you know, stuff like that over the years and we we basically bring how we are with our friends at a restaurant. My wife okay. and I bring how we are in that setting to the podcast. Okay. So we bring ourselves. We, exactly. One hundred percent. You know. So are you on iTunes, Apple Podcast? Your side. What platforms are you on? Uh, we're on Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify, Breaker, Overcast, okay. Pocket oh. Cast, Radio Public, and Anchor. I gotta catch up. I love it. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah. If they go to anchor.fm slash get down on it, that's our profile. That's, okay, and, get down on and, it. Yep. And wow. you see everything right there. And we even that's, have a website uh, with a link in that in that profile where you can click on that and go see our website. Okay, good. I got to go look at that part too. I want you to talk about that book, City of Red. Very interesting. But I know yeah, they got to relaunch it, but what is it about? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to love talking about this because how it all started was years ago, like 10 years ago, my wife and I went to uh, 
Whetstone National Park up here. Mm -hmm. And me and her went, she brought some paper, I brought a notebook and we were sitting by the river and we, she was writing poems and I was kind of writing something. Okay. And I came, up, I came up with an idea for a story. And the idea for the story was a, he, a homeless man who used to be a made man in the mafia. Okay. Is, and he's forced to live apart from his family, but he lives as a homeless man so he can keep an eye on him. Okay. And mm -hmm. I started creating that story over the next year or two. And something happened where I fell in love with all these other characters okay. that I created. Right. And I said, I need to go back and tell a story from the beginning because mm -hmm. I just couldn't concentrate on what I was initially set to do. Okay. So I went back and I, I, I hashed it out. I came up with this book called City of Red. It's called City of Red Part One. Right. And it's not a thin book. It's, it's very thick. It's, it's about 500 pages. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And it's, it's a crown family drama. Um, but I, I don't necessarily focus on the crime okay. or the mafia. I kind of focus on relationships. Okay. Uh, these intangible bonds that connects us all one to right. another. Okay. What, what makes family? What doesn't make family? Mm hmm There's all these connective tissues that, that I play with, and I play with the idea of how far one would go for the other because right. – it's a question in my mind, how far would I go for my family, my wife, right. my kids? Right. Mm -hmm. Would I be I willing to kill somebody for them? I, I would say, yeah, but I don't know, you know. Okay. Uh, uh, so a piece of me is in each and every one of the characters in the book, good and oh, bad. Really? Okay, and, different parts of your character. Yeah, and the book takes place in the uh, 1970s, follows a guy named Alfonso Machetti. Okay. <laughs> and he... He's a, he's, he's an, he was an orphan. He was given away as a baby to a woman and he was raised and he grew up to be in the local crown family. And, and one night that crown family is taken out, killed, presumably by the mayor of the city. But you quick, you quickly find out that he's being uh, basically controlled by another guy who has returned to the city and take it back as his uh, as his property because he says it's his by birthright because mm. his, because his his ancestor founded the city. Okay. So Alfonso gets exiled to a prison called Blackgate, and okay. this prison it it operates outside the law under its own set of rules. And while he's in prison, he sort of loses his mind mm, mm -hmm. he deals with ptsd he deals yeah. with uh trauma he deals with uh <clears throat> all these things he sees a ghost of his friend named tommy that he had to kill early on in the book okay wow and, and, tommy, and tommy haunts him and it's not a ghost but right but it's an image and it's it's his consciousness yelling back at him you know right or yeah consciousness, or unconsciousness. Uh -huh. and, and I, so i'll play with that idea uh at some point, Alfonso learns of his birth mother, and she is dying from Alzheimer's. Mm. And she reaches out. She wants to see him one last time before she dies. Okay. And then that is the crux of the book right there. Wow. It's him, it's him getting out of prison. Okay. Him getting broken, uh, him getting freed from prison mm -hmm. by, his, uh, by some guys that he never knew before until this moment they were inserted into the prison to break him out okay by his birth mother's husband so that he can see his mom before she dies and it's sort of and it's it goes a lot deeper than that is every character yeah. that i that i created i created so that they could almost be the main character of the book themselves right okay they, i made sure they each had a purpose and right and there, there's this one character named um, Oscar Royal. He's a detective in Cold Harbor City. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the city of red. That'll be okay. called city oh, of red. Okay. Gotcha. And, and uh, his father is a former surgeon and he's an alcoholic and horrible, horrible, abusive drunk. And, okay. and uh, 
they have to work together in this book and they're constantly fighting with each other about the past issues and I have this one particular scene where this this guy's father he goes out to the field behind his house he's butt naked wow. and he, okay. he's screaming to the stars he's he's completely intoxicated okay. and he's screaming to the stars he's like crying and screaming mm -hmm. and and his son goes to him and and come to find out that's come to find out that was the uh anniversary of his wife's death oh. and he's in so much pain he okay. regrets so much he's out there doing that and that's that's the moment when father and son come together and the son kind of lets some of that edgy uh -huh. that edgy hate that he had for his father kind of right. melt away okay and those are the kind of issues i really stick to in the book wow it's a lot i can see you saying some parts of character i can see here certain themes that you talked about earlier in that story and i can see yeah. why it's a series because i'm following it like a movie in my mind i'm like that could be a little youtube series <laughs> yeah i got it's 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 going to be six books each okay. book is going to be two parts okay um because it's going to be set in two different eras it's a city of red part one in the 70s in the in the 1970s uh -huh. and then and then City of Red Part Two is going to be a couple of years later. Okay. Um, and uh, I got to get up and plug my phone in because it's going to die. <laughs> and that's okay. We're going to wrap up too as well. Yeah. So, yeah. So, City of Red is two parts, and City of Demons, two parts, okay. and then City of, City of Dead Kings. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. You got imagination. I do. I've been, I've been, working to get to this point for a long, long time. And I'm finally, it makes I'm, a good finally I'm finally producing some yes. actual readable material. <laughs> right. I got you. It's, it's trial and error. It's process is learning while you're doing it and taking pointers from maybe people you reach out to, or, you know, it's just so much stuff we have access to online. You know, there's a yeah. lot you can learn. Yeah. Wow. I so appreciate you coming on and sharing your story and I'm happy to see, you know, you hear about your process and to where you are now and then finding that new purpose and how what you're doing now is affecting the next generation, your children. So they get to mm -hmm. see more of the, what's, how old is your oldest child? Well, Alex, he's 15. Okay. I was going to say most of them getting to see the new you, you know, the more improved and, you know, yeah. you, they won't have two. I'm the oldest one. I don't know. Maybe he's seen a lot of things, but we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> But yeah, how is it? Whole, that, that'll be a whole different uh, interview. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> We've been on another hour. But thanks again so much. I want you to tell the people again, I guess, the name of your website, where to find you on social media. All right. Yeah. So if you want to find our website, I, we don't own a domain yet. So okay. you can go to uh, the anchor.fm uh, slash get down on it. Okay. Yeah, so that's our anchor profile. That's where we have our podcast originated, originally created from. Okay. And if you go there, you'll find the link where you can where you can go to our website. And on okay, our website, right. you can find um a few blog posts about about uh how I work, how I create my my characters, my books, my stories, things like that. Right. And you will see more details about what's coming next from my wife and I okay. in, in books. Uh so if anyone's interested in following me, you can find me on Twitter at the writer, Chris one, the number one. Right. And then I'm on Facebook as just Chris love. All right. Well, thanks again for joining. I hope everybody was just got some more understanding or, um, just for tuning in and just being a part of the whole conversation. And it's a conversation that needs to be, you know, discussed and, and, just getting more information. I think it empowers everybody to talk about, like, you know, Chris, you're feeling free more about talking about things that you have experiences because you just never know who you touch and you never know who's watching this podcast. I've done a lot of podcasts with people who experience trauma and, and I get feedback from people that come in my DM and say, I was touched by this person's story or I thought I was going through this by myself. I felt like I was going crazy, but when I heard Chris' story, you know, it really made me feel like I'm not in this by myself. You may have encouraged somebody to go get help, you know, counseling therapy instead of sitting and you know how it is to suppress things and hold things in and not deal with it. And you, and mm -hmm. then you experience the power of 
you know, talking, talking about it, releasing it. And you're, you're using different outlets, which is great. You're using the books, the vlogging, you know, your podcast. I believe all that is therapeutic. You know, I, I believe the whole, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm one of those people. I can turn anything to therapeutic intervention, <laughs> but it is because it's an emotional letting out. So even yeah. writing your stories, believe it or not, which you may be aware of, it's helping you as well. You know, getting all of that out. 100%. Yeah. It is. And then not, not only that, it's, it's, the, it's the feeling of accomplishment, you know? Yes, yes. I know that feeling, too. You and, finished that, you've done it, yes. Yeah, and I got chills when I said that because it's so true, you know? You know the struggle. You know the struggle and the battle. So when you finally get something done, because then I'm sure you experienced the self-defeated thoughts, like you're not going to finish. And like you said, you kind of went through that, took you so long to get the book, but then you finally got to the end of it. It's like, wow, I, I finished this. I got it. And then you're ready to write the next one. Yeah. As you see, you got serious coming. Don't know, <laughs> I don't know why it's so easy to think negatively. You know what I mean? Yes. It's so easy to think negative. It's, yeah. it's hard. You got to work more muscles to think positive. You know? yeah, Especially what, when you've gone through stuff. It's more of a battle when you have gone through a lot. Yeah. You have, so you're always, you're always in the state sometimes of dismantling all of those negative voices. But the thing is, we all get them. I mean, some people get them more because they've been through stuff. But I think it's just even powerful when you've learned to dismantle them and say, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to let that thought overpower me and cause me to make decisions based on a perception or a belief or a core belief. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when you have those thoughts and deal with core beliefs, like you may, may be naturally insecure in some areas and then you've gone through something and then that really try to dig you even deep into that hole. And then you get to the point where you're like, you know what? Oh, no, no, no. We're not going there anymore. So I, I'm mm -hmm. one of those people who tell people self-talk is great. It's a great intervention. And I said, we used to laugh at people when we was young and see old people talk to themselves. I said, but those older people are more sane than we are because they're getting that stuff out. They're talking and letting it out. You should yeah. be happy that they're talking. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks again, Chris, for joining. I, I, I enjoyed this whole podcast, hearing your story, meeting your son. <laughs> and maybe yeah, one day I can talk to your wife as well. <laughs> yeah, that, that'd be fun. I would love to do that. Yeah. yeah, I would love to do that too. Thanks again. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, talk to you. Okay, thanks everybody for joining in. Have a good evening. Bye bye.